Okay, it's going to be a review of WWE Hell in a Cell 2022 from Chicago. Okay, so last year, I felt like a lot of people just didn't care about Hell in a Cell. It was the last pay-per-view in the Thunderdome. There seemed to be a lack of interest. But then when you look at 2020, they had you know, three great Hell in a Cell matches. I think most people would agree, probably the pay-per-view of the year for 2020. So this year, it was a little bit in between. I, I, I definitely think this is going to go down as a historic show. It's, it's going to go down as probably the most gutsiest performance in WWE history in terms of Cody Rhodes. But, uh, but yeah, you had an awesome you know, women's triple threat to open up the show. And, and uh, I think the Hell in a Cell with Cody and Seth Rollins, I think it's going to go down as a classic ending to uh, a historic trilogy. So, um, so yeah. Let's start off the show. And, and by the way, man, I, I thought Raw was great last night. I don't remember being swerved two times on Raw before before the main event. So so definitely, I, I think WWE had a good weekend. I, th I thought Hell in a Cell was good. And, and then Raw the next night, you definitely had a lot of things unfold. And uh, yeah, it seems like they're stepping up their game with uh, all the attention that AEW is getting. So yeah, this this was a really good uh, you know weekend for the WWE. Um, so you start off with Bianca Belair defending the Raw Women's Championship against Asuka and Becky Lynch. So, yeah, great to see Asuka back. I thought Asuka um, looked incredible here. It looked like she got even a, a little bit better. You know, some of her strikes, you know, the back fist, you know, came off great. She actually did the double ankle lock, which was uh, shades of Kurt Angle from Sacrifice 2007 there. So, yeah, I thought Asuka really is going to add a lot of depth to the women's division. You saw Bianca and uh, Becky, you know, continue the great chemistry that they showed at WrestleMania. And, yeah, I just thought this had a lot of great breakups. Um, yeah, very exciting stuff. You know, Bianca is like a female RVD. I mean, she's just so athletic. She's so strong. And yeah, I thought Becky looked good here. So Becky actually did the um, manhandle slam to Asuka, but Bianca, you know, throws Becky out of the ring and uh, Bianca gets the pinfall over Asuka. So the way this ended, it really felt like Bianca and Becky were going to continue their feud, but it looks like Bianca is going to take on... Rhea Ripley at Money in the Bank. And yeah, this Rhea Ripley thing, and we'll get to a little bit later, but yeah, Rhea Ripley probably going to end up being a women's champion in a stable surrounded by guys. I don't know if you've ever gotten that before, so definitely looking forward to that. But yeah, this this had to be probably the, in my opinion, I think this is the best women's triple threat that they've ever done. I know WrestleMania in 2016, I think it was with Charlotte, Becky, and Sasha. That was really good. Some some thought that stole the show, but I would even put this above that. And, uh, you know, the triple threat from Crown Jewel, where you had all the girls wearing the T-shirts because of the Saudi Arabia bullshit. I thought that was good, but... This one, I felt like it was even better. I, I just, the, the only gripe with this triple threat right here was, you know, if this had happened 10 years earlier at Money in the Bank 2011, I think the crowd would have just lost their mind. Here, I thought the crowd was good. You know, the, the crowd nowadays in WWE, they don't crap on things, but at the same time, they don't really overreact to something if it's really good. So that was my one gripe with the mask. Okay, next up, we got Bobby Lashley taking on Omos and MVP. I thought the video package here was really good. You know, uh, MVP actually cut a battle rap on Bobby Lashley, kind of mocking uh, Lashley's time as ECW champion, calling it a joke, and just had some really good creative punchlines here. You know, I, I don't know if it, we've ever seen someone rap this well to uh, promote a video package since John Cena. So, yeah, props to MVP on the uh, the battle rap there. I thought it actually added a lot to this match. But, uh, but yeah, Lashley was really over. The fans got behind him. Uh, one part in the match when Omos, Omos actually does a shoulder block to the barric through the barricade to Bobby Lashley, he did it a little bit soft. And, um, I, you know, th that's one example where, you know, you, you can notice a mistake and you can, not exactly a mistake, but, you know, th th those are like the little things that I think people backstage would notice. And, um, you know, I just think a little thing like that probably separates, you know, a guy like Omos from a guy like Roman and Brock. Because, you know, when they do that, you know, spear through the barricade, it just comes off so much more clean and so much more precise than, uh, than that spot right there. But, yeah, Lashley gets the assist from Cedric Alexander. He was a little bit... You know, kind of scolded Cedric backstage, but ultimately said he was proud of him. And, you know, for Cedric, uh, you know, picking his own direction as he uh, as they both move away from being involved with MVP in the Hurt Business. And it looks like Lashley is going to be going for the championship as he, you know, 
he uh, wrapped his hands around his waist, kind of uh, symbolically showing that he wants to go for the belt. He even grabbed someone's championship, so we move on from there. We got Kevin Owens uh, taking on Ezekiel, who is actually El Elias. So that's, that's how this whole storyline started. Kevin Owens uh, felt disrespected that Ezekiel won't come clean and admit he's the same guy that's uh, Elias. My, my gripe about this whole thing is if anyone main events WrestleMania with Stone Cold Steve Austin, you know, why would you care about Elias pretend, pretending he's somebody else? It almost feels like it's not that important for Kevin Owens to care about, but at the same time, you got to give Owens something to do here. So this almost had like a Ultimate Warrior and Honky Tonk Man type of feel to it. You know, Ezekiel's coming out there, and he's got a great physique. Like, he never really, like when he was alive, she never really knew that Ezekiel had like an Ultimate Warrior type of physique. He's actually wearing the tassels. He almost looks like a mix of uh, Warrior and Savage just by his uh, his new attire. And it looked like he was going to go for like a, a squash victory after he got the elbow drop. But uh, Owens kicks out of it. And uh, yeah, I, I thought Owens was good here. I, I thought the match was actually a lot of fun. Probably the most underrated match of the night. Owens did hit the pop-up powerbomb. Couldn't put him away. But ultimately, Owens gets the victory with the stunner. I think this is the right decision. Y you want to give Owens... Uh, a victory after what he did with Austin. You know, this would have killed Owens' momentum. But it uh, looks like this is going to continue as uh, Ezekiel came clean and finally admitted that he wasn't, that he actually is Elias. But then he said he was just lying by, and he pulled a Kevin Owens. So it looks like uh, Ezekiel is still lying about being Elias. So I, I don't know. I, I'm not a big fan of the storyline, but it gives Owens something to do. And uh, we move on from there. Uh, next up, we got the Judgment Day featuring Edge, Damian Priest, and Rhea Ripley taking on AJ Styles, Finn Balor, and Liv Morgan. Okay, I thought this was a really, really good six-man tag. You could argue that it was raw quality, but I thought it was excellent stuff. This was definitely the best match uh, in between the opener and the main event. And... Um, you know, the, the, thing that, the thing that made this a little bit tough was that the women were only allowed to touch each other and you know, the men couldn't touch the women, but it definitely played into the finish. So it was a great, a great showing from Liv Morgan. This was easily like the biggest match she was ever involved in. So she and Rhea actually did some really good work together. Um, Liv actually did a beautiful job of, uh, you know, getting the fans into it. And she worked the crowd quite well. I, I think everyone backstage uh, will be quite impressed with Liv's uh, performance here. But the story of the match is just Rhea Ripley. And um, she actually distracts Finn Balor uh, for the ending here. And Edge actually gets the spear on Balor. But I'll tell you what, guys. I thought AJ brought his A game. You even saw AJ actually bust out a, a sequence of back fists and strikes. Very similar to what Asuka did. And uh, AJ was explosive. Hits the phenomenal forearms. Even AJ and Finn Balor did some beautiful double team moves that when they uh, springed outside of the ring. So I, I got to say, you know, just just lots of good action here. The ending, and looking back on it, they they really did a good job of making Finn Balor look strong here. He he definitely was the star of the show, um, but you know, it's it's almost like when Rhea distracted Finn from doing the coup de gras at the end of this thing. It's almost like that's where the tide turned. Almost like Finn was mesmerized by uh, Rhea Ripley's uh, leadership. And, um, you know, F Finn Balor has joined the Judgment Day stable. And I, I got to say, guys, this was shocking. I mean, you thought the, the, the segment between Cody and Seth was shocking to open up Raw. I, I got to say, I was, I was swerved here. Never in a million years that I think Edge was going to get kicked out of his own stable. So Edge actually wins the match here with the spear over Finn Balor. But still... Judgment Day turns on him. Damian Priest just says that there's one thing holding us back, and they decided it was Edge, and they brought out Finn Balor. So Finn Balor actually joins Judgment Day, and there's a total beatdown with Finn Balor, Damian Priest, and Rhea Ripley on Edge. So they kick Edge out of Judgment Day. Wow. I, I mean, I, I don't. I mean, what it really reminds me of this is the first time I've after, actually seen a leader kicked out of a stable maybe since uh, Alex Shelley kicked out of Generation Next and Ring of Honor you got to go back to 2004 for that so uh, it's, it's been a long time I mean there's even other things that it does remind me of but yeah very rarely 
Have you seen, you know, the, the, the head of a stable just kick to the curb like that? Uh, but hey, man, I, I think this would be a huge opportunity for Finn Balor. It would be great. This this will give Finn Balor a great chance to work with Edge. I was looking forward to seeing Finn Balor and AJ Styles mix it up as well. Hopefully we'll get that. So yeah, and let's be honest, you know, Finn Balor has not, you know, um, you know, since he won the Universal Championship in 2000, at SummerSlam 2016, you know, he hasn't been able to get back to that spot. You know, he hasn't been able to, to, to find that groove. And, you know, may, maybe this is exactly what he needs. And and without a doubt, Rhea Ripley, you know, she she's going to get the title shot against Bianca Belair and Money in the Bank. I could definitely see Rhea, you know, becoming like the a, a, a woman's champion, leading a stable, you know, f- full of men. I don't know if that's ever been done before, so give Rhea credit, too. So, yeah, that, that was a really good six-man tag match right there. Uh, so definitely check it out. And the, the, the Swerve on Raw was, um, you know, mind-blowing. Never in a million years did I think Edge was going to get kicked out of his own stable. And, hey, you know, m- maybe that, that goes back to the, the point I was trying to make where I just, I just don't think the fans really wanted to boo Edge. And, and, and I think maybe there's too much value as Edge is a babyface. And... You know, maybe maybe it has something to do with Edge and AJ Styles falling flat. Maybe that's that's part of the decision why they made uh, to turn Edge back to being a babyface. So yeah, shocking shit, and uh, we'll see how it plays out from there. But it should be really good for Finn Balor. I think that's the bottom line you could take from it. All right, next up, yeah, you have Mad Cat Moss taking on Happy Corbin. This ended up being a no holds barred match. So yeah, really well put together video package. This shows the transformation of Mad Cat Moss coming back from uh, from the beatdown from Happy Corbin. And I, you, you got to give it up to Mad Cat. You know, he's got a great physique. Um, I'm, I'm I'm sure Vince and a lot of people backstage are you know really impressed with um, you know the kind of shape he's in. And, you know, this is a very well-executed match. You can just tell both guys know each other quite well. They used a ton of weapons, steel steps, chairs. You know, Madcap got his revenge on Happy Corbin. Very well-executed stuff, but it felt a little bit cold. It felt a little bit cold, this part of the card. It, it almost felt like a lot of people aren't watching SmackDown. There was a lot of asshole chance for Happy Corbin, but it was lukewarm, though. There were certain parts of the match where I thought Corbin had a ton of heat. Other parts of the match where it just felt like no one really cared. And, um... Yeah, Mad Cop tried to do a good job of, you know, getting the Chicago fans to get excited about his victory. But ultimately, it, it felt a little bit cold. Uh, next up, you got Austin Theory. I guess he's going by Theory now, taking on Mustafa Ali. I thought this could have been an awesome way to open up the show. Personally, I, I love the women's triple threat, but but this would have thrived if it was the opener. I thought Mustafa Ali definitely had the fans behind him. You know, he was wearing the Chicago colors. He's actually from Chicago. I didn't know that. Uh, but yeah, theory, theory gets a lot of heat. He, he's not a likable guy. He's very talented. He's got a, he's got a great, he, he actually does have a good look for a heel. He, he really does. Uh, I mean, as, as annoying as the gimmick is, he does draw a lot of heat and he's a good wrestler too. What you, what he does well, he does very well. So, um, yeah, the, the, the Mustafa Ali had the crowd on the edge of their seat for the uh, step over cross face but ultimately like the th- this is another match where it just felt like it could have been on raw it felt a little bit cold to be in that spot but ultimately theory gets the uh retains the united states championship and we move on to the main event we got cody rhodes taking on seth frig and rollins hell in a cell match this is the trilogy the third match in the trilogy yeah so what what it really reminded me of is the triple h uh Batista feud and um, yeah this is not foreign territory for a a, a heel to put over a baby face three times in a row you know um, you know Triple H did it for Batista and Batista also did it for Cena and Seth Rollins does it for his former mentor's son in Cody Rhodes so yeah obviously the story here was that Cody actually uh, tore his pectoral muscle. It, it you know, based on uh, what Corey Graves was saying on commentary, um, on on the go home so, show, they were trying to sh- shoot an angle on Raw where you know they couldn't be separated because you know the security had to come out to keep them separated. And when Cody was trying to jump through the security, 
it looks like that's where the injury took place. So it sucks, man. It sucks that Punk got injured. It sucks that Cody got injured. You know, you could argue that these are both non-competitive injuries, injuries that had nothing to do with the matches. So it, it really does put a, a, a dark um, cloud over the summertime that we're not going to get Cody, not going to get a, a CM Punk as part of the summertime. But, but Cody um, is all... Black and blue, he has a maroon-like hematoma over his pictorial muscle and uh, decides to wrestle uh, the match. And, um, I mean, there's there's a lot of things to say about it. I do not think Vince forced Cody to wrestle this match. I'm going to say I think they left it up to Cody. I, I I seriously doubt a doctor cleared Cody to wrestle. So, but I... I, I feel like it was a Cody decision. I mean, let, let's 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 be honest here about the money situation. I do not think that Cody did this for the money, but at the same time, I think it's important to realize that when Cody signed this contract, it was $5 million downside guarantee plus incentives. Obviously, if you main event a WWE pay-per-view, that's more incentives than than pretty much anything. So I'm sure there was a lot of money at, at stake here, but ultimately... I think Cody is very passionate about the history of the WWE. When when you saw Cody come back uh, with all those press conferences, he was talking about how he has this weird Royal Rumble uh, record for uh, eliminations and he wanted to continue. So there you go right there. It's like he, he knows the history of the Royal Rumble. You know, this is his first chance to main event Hell in a Cell as a singles wrestler. I don't think this is Cody's first Hell in a Cell, though. I think he was actually in... Um, Hell in a Cell with uh, Degeneration X when he was part of Legacy. So it's actually Cody's second Hell in a Cell, uh, to be exact. So this is actually Rollins' fifth Hell in a Cell. So yeah, so Rollins is really approaching like Triple H and Undertaker territory in terms of number of times in Hell in a Cells. But yeah, no, my, my point was, I just think Cody, like you would have had to kill him to keep him out of this match. And I just think they left the decision up to Cody. I think Seth is so talented and he's such a good worker. He knows how to be safe. And, you know, they were able to get the job done. And I mean, the fact that you had to use weapons here too, I'm sure that made it a little bit more difficult, but they, they pulled it off. And I didn't come away from this thing thinking that Cody was risking his life or, you know, risking uh, a, a life-threatening injury. I mean, most guys, you know, this is an injury that has happened time and time again. You know, you go back to 2007, you know, Cena had the injury. Mr. Kennedy had the injury. I, I believe Undertaker had the injury. Batista had the injury. And, uh, you know, none of those guys took a chance and, and wrestled. You know, Cena was actually promoted uh, to wrestle Randy Orton, I believe, in a last man standing match. And he opted not to wrestle. So, yeah, it's it's very risky. Uh, but when you look at, at Cody, man, I, I don't think anyone has ever had, you know, that big of a hematoma or that bi- big of a buildup of blood. And everybody could just see it. And you, you could see the amount of pain that he was in. And I'll tell you, man, they, they pulled it off, man. They, they pulled it off. They had a, a great Hell in a Cell match. I, I thought Rollins, uh, he came out there with the polka dots, you know, kind of a tribute to Dusty. So so if you guys don't know, I I, I believe Seth was telling Austin that, you know, the like one of the first guys to really believe in, in Seth when he was in uh, FCW or NXT was actually Dusty Rhodes. So, um, and you know, if you watch the Dusty Rhodes documentary, Vin- Vince actually decided that you know Dusty would look great in uh, polka dots. So that was actually a Vince decision, and yeah, and and Dusty made it work. You know the you know wrestling in polka dots. So it was almost like Rollins was paying tribute and mocking Cody at the same time with the polka dots. But yeah, I mean everything they did here was was just great stuff. I mean it was very dramatic. I, I got to say Cody show great dexterity. I mean, anyone out there that wants to become a wrestler, wants to play sports, I I can't emphasize enough, you know, develop your offhand, develop your left hand if you're a righty, because, um, you know, it makes you twice as deadly. And and you could definitely tell, man, Cody really used his left hand here with the um, with the crossroads and just everything. You know, Cody was able to get through this match because he's very ambidextrous. So, 
just wanted to point out that had a lot to do with it. There was a point in the match where when Seth brought out the table, they were chanting, thank you, Rollins, because the fans, still the fans were chanting, we want tables the whole night, even for the uh, the no Hose bar match with uh, Happy Corbin. And then Rollins had to flip the fans off just to get the heat back, so that was pretty cool. But, yeah, I mean, they, they brought out the Texas Bull Rope, as obviously Dusty has a history with the uh, Texas Bull Rope matches, and, and so does Cody as well, I think, in AEW. So... Yeah, breathtaking performance from Kobe. Pr Cody, pro probably the most uh, gutsiest match I've ever seen any anyone wrestling. You could just tell he was in a lot of pain. Yeah, I mean, you could see the injury. I mean, we've seen Kurt Angle wrestle uh, WrestleMania 19 where he needed to get neck surgery. Benoit wrestled at King of the Ring where he knew he needed to get neck surgery. But it wasn't like you could see you know, any type of internal scarring on the neck. You know, you could see so much. I mean, it just looked nasty, all, all the blood on Cody's pectoral region. And, uh, you know, Rollins even, you know, taking out the sledgehammer, going to work on it. Uh, but, hey, man, they, they pulled it off. Very, very dramatic. I, I thought this whole trilogy was incredible. I think you can argue any of these three matches is the best one. You, I mean, personally, I would say this is my least favorite because... You know, you could tell Cody was in a lot of pain. It just doesn't have as much replay value as the other two matches where I just thought the wrestling w was phenomenal. But, uh, but yeah, th this was this is going to go down as the most memorable of the trilogy because of the injury. And you got to give it up to Cody. I I'll tell you what, guys, like nothing tests your character like sports. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there. My grandfather is one of them. He even told me, we're talking about the Zach Greinke contract back in 2015. You know, 30, you know, $1 million a game, $30 million a year. He was just telling me that athletes are overpaid. But, you know, I, I wish I could go back in time and just tell him, you know, nothing really tests the will and tests your character like sports. You know, fighting through an injury, playing through an injury. And it's a tough situation, too, because... I remember Grant Hill trying to play through a sprained ankle. He ended up getting a staph infection. It almost ruined his career. So there are situations where playing through an injury could be really bad. And, you know, I remember Derek Rose took a ton of ton of criticism for not playing when he was cleared. So it's a tough situation. It, it, it really is. But um, I, I, I think what Cody did here, man, he I, in terms of the WWE, I, I don't I don't think we've ever seen. A, a main event where someone put in this type of uh, serious gut check. I mean, the only thing that could really surpass this in terms of the actual match and the actual performance was uh, Brian Danison at Glory Honor 5, um, night two against Kenta, where he wrestled with the separated shoulder. I, I mean, Ni Nigel's wrestled through some pretty nasty injuries as well, but... But yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think any injury has ever been, you know, that out there in the open where everyone could just clear, clear as day. There's no faking it. Like the 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 blood is is there, engraved internally in his chest, and you can see the black and blue. You can see the hematoma, and Cody still goes out there and you know gets the job done. And you know, it's just it just it just shows you, man, the type of passion that that Cody has and I, I think that's I think that's what people needed to see the, the 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 fans and everybody they needed to see that type of passion um and you ha you haven't seen that in, in in quite a long time I would say especially in the main event scene within the WWE um but hey man hell in a cell I, I it's gonna go down as memorable I, I don't I would definitely say that the middle of this card you definitely had a, a lot of raw quality stuff. I, I wouldn't say the pay-per-view was great from top to bottom, but uh, both without a doubt, this this performance from Cody and this main event, it's, it's going to go down in history as uh, a, a classic, must-see stuff, and a great trilogy between Cody and Seth. And the swerve on Raw as well. You know, when, when Seth came out there and said, I, I know that uh that dusty is proud of his son you can see cody crying and you know it, it looks like cody's uh gonna have a nice farewell and then all of a sudden rollins comes out of nowhere and uh takes out the sledgehammer and 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 beats the crap out of cody and uh you know you, ha you had to have Corey graves and the raw announce team actually cut a promo talking about how how low seth rollins is sunk and yeah i mean it was crazy it was it was quite the swerve i i, I really felt like they were going to end it like that with Seth Rollins turning babyface, but yeah, there's no way Cody was coming back at Money in the Bank. So th this is a this is like an injury that will probably take, 
you know, maybe four to six months. You know, hopefully Cody be back at Survivor Series. The the, the one that really came back faster than anybody from the injury was probably John Cena. You know, he, he got injured in early October in 2007. And, you know, he shocked everybody when he came back at the Royal Rumble because he was supposed to be out until June. So it could take a long time. Hopefully Cody didn't do any extra damage and uh, comes back as fast as possible. I mean, I mean, what a what a turnaround for Cody, though. I'll tell you. When you look back at Grand Slam, when he was getting booed out of the building, even in AEW, at full gear, he got booed. I mean, he was just, um, I don't know what it was, man, why why the AEW fans turned on him. I, I really, that, that really had to probably bother him. And you look at it now where he's probably by far the most over guy in the business and uh, without a doubt, the most over guy in the WWE. So... Yeah, I, I really thought he was going to get the title shot against Roman, maybe at SummerSlam, and it looks like it, we might have to wait until WrestleMania. But when he gets it, man, he's he's earned it, man. He deserves a title reign, and uh, really happy for him, man. Great, great performance from Cody. You can't say enough about it. Okay, so um, after Double or Nothing, a, a lot of things went down on Dynamite and on Rampage. I, I just want to touch on it to kind of set up what's going to happen on Dynamite. Uh, tomorrow night um okay so let, let's start with mjf first so mjf you know gets squashed by wardlow at, at double or nothing you're hearing all types of rumors about how he wants to leave the company then he cut the uh the pipe bomb on tony khan where he basically ends the promo by calling him a fucking mark uh yeah so if you haven't seen the promo yet definitely check it out i, I don't think it was mjf's best promo but it's probably going to go down as his most famous, uh, most controversial. My take on it is this: I, I really, and I could be wrong. I, it, and and this is this is an example of why it's working because it it seems to be divided. A lot of people think this is a shoot. A lot of people think it's a work. So that's probably a good thing. But my take on it is, I think this was the uh, resolution they came to or the compromise that they came up with. In terms of uh, the Wardlow stuff. So with Wardlow, obviously he had to win the match because of the stipulation. And, you know, they wanted to get Wardlow on the AEW roster. And, yeah, it probably would have been tough for MJF and Wardlow to work a 20-minute match and, you know, have it all make sense. So I just think this is what they decided. You know, we talked about how, you know, how you know MJF is so talented he's going to get the heat back. But, God, you didn't expect it to be like this. I mean, he's got more heat than anybody right now. So I, I think I – think this whole thing is a throwback to the Brian Pillman days. You know, Tony Khan was a huge WCW fan, huge ECW fan. You know, these are the type of things that that Pillman was, um, you know, uh, you know, got famous for. So I, I, I just think they, I think the, they planned it out like this. I think that whole promo that Tony Khan did at the press conference, where they asked him about the Bischoff thing and Punk being a financial flop, I think he kind of played it up a little bit ju just to set up that whole mark situation where he actually almost did come off like a mark about how you know he he almost named every single cm punk match from aew so far i was like how many matches is he gonna name when he mentioned the matt Seidel match on rampage i was like what the fuck but hey man um i i actually liked uh tony khan's passion there but it, it's almost like they they used that as an excuse so mjf can call Tony Khan a mark. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I liked a lot of what MJF touched on, especially the New Japan stuff. And it kind of got me thinking. MJF going into Forbidden Door as the anti-New Japan guy. I mean, I, I think that would make a lot of sense. And, and I got to admit, New Japan was, was, was great, man. Like when they went on their run with the G1 Climax Tournament from like 2013 to 2016, they had an amazing run. I'm not taking anything away from, you know, the quality of wrestling that New Japan, you know, gave us. But what frustrated me on YouTube and, and just as a fan in general is how, you know, America just wasn't keeping up. When you looked at the match of the year voting in the mid 2010s, it's like we, we just we, we, just, we just couldn't keep up. You know, nothing from Ring of Honor, WWE or, you know, TNA or whatever promotions were thriving in America. You just obviously all the match of the year lists were New Japan dominated. So it, it kind of makes me feel good 
that MJF is kind of taking a anti New Japan approach because there's there's been a lot of back and forth in terms of you know a lot of the smart marks that like Japanese wrestling. If you don't watch Japanese wrestling, you're not a real wrestling fan. So it's it's a very unique way to kind of uh, promote a pay-per-view where you can have MJF being the New Japan antagonist. Uh, so, yeah, I I, th- I think that's the way to go. And I, I could be wrong. And, and I know some people look at MJF getting the title shot at Forbidden Door and not finding it very appealing. But it doesn't have to be the main event. You know, you could still have, you know, you could still have, you know, Brian Danielson and a lot of the other guys on the roster in high-profile matches. But uh, but I, I just think this. I, I think with that with the promo that MJF just gave and 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 the momentum with and with the Punk injury, I think this is a perfect time to put the belt on MJF because it's an interim reign, and it'll still set up a rubber match, or undisputed championship match between Punk and MJF when Punk does come back. So I think the positives definitely outweigh the negatives, and uh, yeah, I I would love to see it happen. I I just don't. I mean, I just can't see. AEW going on with this summer with Punk being out, Omega being out, and then it sounds to me like some people are under the impression that MJF is going to be suspended the whole summer. I think that would be a mistake. I I just feel like you know putting the belt on MJF right now. Um, yeah, I I think it's too good to pass up. I, I think he's earned it. I, I think this is a good way to buy time. You know, put the championship on him and buy some time until he's a free agent, where you finally do decide to pay him. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, when people look at MJF and Forbidden Door, yeah, obviously MJF versus Tanahashi, MJF versus Goto, whichever one they go with, it, it doesn't scream very sexy. But like I was saying, it doesn't have to be the main event. So so this is the situation on uh, on Dynamite with the punk injury. So, it, so they're going to do a battle royal at the beginning of the show. And then the winner of the battle royal is going to face John Moxley in the main event. And then who, the winner of Moxley and the Battle Royal winner is going to face the winner of Tanahashi and Goto. And then the winners of both of those matches are going to face at Forbidden Door uh, for the championship. So that's how it's going to play out right there. So, yeah, really exciting stuff. It, it, it's exciting, but it does suck that CM Punk is going to be out with the injury. I mean, when uh, so Punk actually got injured, and I, I watched it back on Rampage. Before the match with FTR, the six-man tag, he jumped, he did the stage dive into the crowd, and you could you could see him looking at his foot. So he has a broken foot uh, because of the stage dive. Um, l- let me just touch on the first couple of things went through my mind. I, I thought, yeah, man, it's kind of an embarrassing way to get injured. It's almost a retarded way to get injured. Um, and it, it kind of, you know, anytime Punk did those stage dives, I guess he started doing this when uh, when he won the championship in 2011. He did it in WWE a lot of times, but uh, finally bit him in the ass and uh, he actually broke his foot. Um, but I, I'll tell you what, the more and more I think about it, it's just, like you said, it's just a bump in the road. You know, I actually crushed my pinky Right before Christmas last year, I just slammed the door on my pinky and I had to get stitches. You know, the nail got all black and blue and I had to grow back. And I, I was beating myself up over it. I was like, what a fucking idiot. Why are you such a fucking idiot? Why did you do that? But but then, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, you can't beat yourself up over it. You know, it's just a bump on the road and, and you just move on. Um so that's you know that that's all it is you know that's that's all you can really say it's it's not like an Owen Hart situation where you're never going to get Punk back or you know Cody gets injured and you're never going to get him back it you know it's just it's just you're not just you're not going to get him for the summertime but eventually you'll get him back so yeah it doesn't make sense to beat yourself up over it so I mean you just feel bad for Punk you know it's it's depressing news but you know he'll come back from it um so yeah it looks like the summer of Punk will be on hold, but officially Punk is not going to lose the championship. He'll just have to face the uh, interim champion when he does come back, and then I guess they'll unify the belts. I guess that's the situation now. But uh, if anyone has any thoughts on the CM Punk foot injury, so so from what I understand, it's a broken foot. A broken foot is an injury. I don't think we've really had uh, that much time, you know, that many injuries in wrestling with a broken foot. Um, 
It, 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 I mean, it, it could be. It is a tough injury to come back from uh, potentially because, you know, the, the foot area doesn't get a lot of blood flow. So uh, it, it, when you look at the history of NBA injuries, you know, Bill Walton's had the injuries like a seven footer. Yao Ming had it. He was seven foot five. So with, when big men have this injury, it's a tough injury to come back from because of the blood flow to the foot it makes it very difficult to heal. Uh, but someone like CM Punk, that's six two, six three. I th- I think he'll be fine. I mean, you know, Michael Jordan had the injury, he broke his navicular bone. Kevin Durant had the injury, and they came back better than ever. So to to think that Punk is never going to be the same because of the injury, I I think uh, I think it could have been worse. You know, if he tore his ACL, tore his Achilles, you know, blew out his knee. Um, yeah, I mean, even if if the Triple H injury happened, blew out his quad, I think that would have been a bit worse. Yeah, the the foot the foot injury, it could be tricky, but um, but yeah, I I, I think he'll come back from it fine. Um, but yeah, um, when you look back at uh, AEW this past week, though, uh, I th- I thought they had a you know in terms of matches, you got a great main event between Garcia and Moxley. I thought that was one of Garcia's best uh, performances in AEW so far. So definitely check it out. And, and probably better than anything from the pay-per-view is actually Young Bucks and Lucha Brothers to kick off Rampage. Jericho even said this is one of the best matches we've ever had in Rampage. Uh, so yeah, any anytime you don't know what AEW doesn't know what to do, they could just throw on Young Bucks and Lucha Brothers and you're guaranteed a classic. Uh, also Scorpio Sky and Dante Martin. Uh, for the TNT Championship. That was another good Rampage main event. So, yeah, I, I thought they had a good showing out to the West Coast, but I guess we're always going to look back at, you know, the um, you know the LA Forum show and the Ontario show as where CM Punk got injured. And Punk actually uh, came out and um, gave a speech on Rampage. And it, it was it was probably the closest thing you ever got to Shawn Michaels losing his smile. A little bit of a different situation, though, where, you you, you know, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's it's funny. It's funny. I don't think anyone's ever going to, um, you know, criticize Punk, you know, for crying in this situation like they did with HBK. So um, it's a little bit of a different situation. But I, I don't think, you know, I, the, the only the only other guy that you, you thought of that had this type of uh, that relinquished the belt like this, maybe Batista must have done it a couple different times. But, yeah. When, when you look at Punk's promo with the championship and crying, it's probably the closest, you know, Punk didn't officially relinquish the title, but it's probably the closest thing you, you ever got to see since uh, the Shawn Michaels uh, Lost My Smile uh, speech. Okay, and to wrap up the video, is going to be a quick review of NXT In Your House 2022, the event that happened on Saturday. Um, yeah, you know, I was actually going to skip this show. Um, you know, I, I would definitely say more so than War Games and, and Stand and Deliver. This feels like the new version of NXT 2.0. You know, the other shows definitely had, you know, more leftovers of the black and gold. And the and obviously with Dolph Ziggler, part of the main roster, it, they, those shows probably had a little bit more depth. This show right here, I could definitely see a lot of people skipping it. It definitely had more of a developmental type of feel. But out of curiosity, I, I found myself... Uh, checking out the show and um, yeah I, I mean I was pretty much right I didn't think it was bad but you know at the same time it's good to keep an eye on the product with um, you know because you never know you might find that diamond in the rough I would definitely say Braun Breaker is a hell of a talent a, a good guy to keep your eye on but uh, but let's get through it um, first match on the show you had Tony D'Angelo's family in a six-man tag against Legado del Fantasma, uh, led by Santos Escobar. I thought this was probably the match of the night. I thought it was the most fun. I thought the crowd was was hot here. Uh, it definitely felt like a clashing of two cultures with the Italians and the Latinas. And, uh, yeah, uh, the, the Legado del Fantasma team was, was awesome. I thought it, they looked cohesive. You just saw a lot of good teamwork between them. I think Santos Escobar uh, looked awesome here. But, um, yeah, the family... Led by uh, Tony D'Angelo, definitely came off like the more heelish tag team. Everything was cool here. I thought the ending was kind of wacky. You know, you had uh, foreign weapons with the brass knucks and the crowbars. And, you know, the stipulation here was kind of 
awkward. I thought, you know, the losing team had to join the winning team stable. So uh, Santos um, reality sunk in and he had to join uh, the family. So it feels like kind of a wacky stipulation, but I guess you need to stay tuned to the television show to see how it, it pans out. But but yeah, I, I, I just thought this was uh, uh, definitely a lot of fun, a clashing of uh, the Italian and the Mexican cultures. And uh, I thought it was good, man. Uh, next up, you had Toxic Attraction. Taking out Kat uh, Katana Chance and uh, Kaden Carter. I would definitely say more than any other match, this is probably the most skippable on the show. I, I, I could just see not a lot of people caring for this. Uh, it, it definitely had a, co you know, I've definitely had a well-distinct heel versus babyface tag team. You know, you got to see some really good stuff from uh, Katana and Kaden. Uh, but ultimately, I just can't see a lot of people really... Um, you know, digging this too much, but it was okay. It wasn't bad. Next up, we had Carmelo Hayes uh, taking on Cameron Grimes. They actually got the poster here for the NXT North American Championship. I would definitely say this. What hurt this match more than anything was Trick Williams, you know, Carmelo's manager. He just, he was just annoying, man. He just, he just took away from the action. There was just so many times where they were working into the rhythm and there's just too much interference from him. But other than that, uh, this is a good battle of the high flyers. I, I thought from an athletic standpoint, this was definitely uh, the one thing you knew was going to deliver. You know, Cameron Grimes, uh, Trevor Lee is a former winner of Ebola, which is well documented. I thought he looked good here. Not, not his best showing. Same thing with Carmelo. I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Uh, for, for both of these guys, to be honest with you. Um, but yeah, probably the highlight of the match, though, was the never seen anything like it before. There was actually a springboard Russian leg sweep into a Spanish fly. I believe it was actually from Carmelo. And it came out came off good, man. Carmelo's a good high flyer. Beautiful leg drop to end the match. So Carmelo uh, regains the NXT North American Championship. Uh, good match, but it it it, it kind of fell a little bit below my expectations. I, I was just I was assuming this was going to run away with the match of the night. I think you know maybe if this had the, the opening spot, it would have had a little bit more juice to it. All right, next up you have Mandy Rose taking on Wendy Wendy Chow or Wendy. Ch yeah, I think it's Wendy Chow. Um, oh my God, you've got to see this gimmick. So this girl, it's like an Asian girl that acts like a kid. You know, she brings out super super soakers. She wrestles in pajamas. Uh, she plays with stuffed animals. She's just very antagonizing in terms of just trying to get, uh, you know, Mandy Rose, you know, really got under Mandy Rose's skin with a lot of childish tactics. So I got to give them credit. You know, this is a pretty original gimmick. I thought the match kind of fell flat. Didn't really, I can't really say I was really that impressed with Wendy. Um, you know, Mandy was just trying to go for the kill. Tons of spine busters on the, uh, in the ring and on the steel steps. That was probably the most dramatic spot in the match when Mandy uh, did the spine buster on the steel, uh, the steel ramp. And Wendy barely got back into the ring. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll say this about Mandy Rose. I, I think she's perfected her look. The brunette with the really nice eyes and the amazing hot tan body she definitely has a lot of star power but you know it, it's just another average uh match right here but at, at the same time you can't knock the decision to promote her because i think she definitely has a lot of star power and she's definitely someone that you know can thrive in a lot of different forms of entertainment uh so it's it's not a bad um Especially when you're in this uh, rebuilding phase right now, it's it's uh, even though the the match is a little bit mediocre, I would definitely say that it's not a bad business decision to promote her as the uh, champion of the brand for the women. All right, next up you had the Cree brothers challenging uh, pretty deadly for the NXT Tag Team Championships. All right, so this pretty deadly tag team of Elton Prince and Kit, Kit Wilson. Oh my God. Uh, this is like a combination of a Fandango, you know, handsome boy modeling school. They come out with the long hair and kind of a, a little bit of John Morrison mixed in there with the entrance. Uh, I really could not get into this thing. I, I, I thought it took forever to get going. I like the Creed Brothers. I like the fact that they promote amateur wrestling. You know, they had a great moment here at the end, winning the tag team championships. Um, 
you know, one of the Cree brothers was actually contemplating using a belt, but he looked at his parents and did the right thing. And I thought the ending came off great. The, the last couple of minutes were really good, but it just took forever for the Cree brothers to start their comeback. Uh, but hey, you know, it was good to see them celebrate with the mom and dad at, at ringside. You know, the, the video package really uh, went into depth about the timeline of all their amateur accomplishments. So I like that about it. The, the, the biggest problem with the match was this felt like something that you could have seen in OVW. It definitely had like a developmental uh, type of feel to it. Um, but at the same time, man, it's just it's a step in the right direction. I think it's uh, something that the Cree brothers can build from. So, yeah, the right team went over. Uh, wasn't really feeling the... The match as a whole, I, I thought the beginning of it was slow as shit, really dominated by Pretty Deadly. But, you know, the Cree brothers turned it around. But I, I can't say that I'm blown away by them um, with this actual match. And then to wrap it up, we got Braun Breaker uh, taking on Joe Gacy. Had Braun gotten disqualified, he would have lost the championship. So, yeah, uh, Gacy here... I got to say, I'm pretty underwhelmed by him. I, I, I think there's some good things about him. I, I think he's got good strikes. He's got good punches. Um, you know, he could be one of these heels. Oh, God, I'm trying to compare him. I, I think he's got a little bit of Bray Wyatt in him, which is not a bad thing. So th there's definitely a, a lot of potential there, but I don't know, man. Th this, this match as a whole... I would just I would just say that, it, you know, it just took forever to for, for Braun to, to start his comeback. Once Braun started coming back and, you know, fighting off of uh, Gacy controlling this thing, it, it got a lot better. I, I, I thought Braun's offense was athletically explosive. You know, the table bump that Gacy took here was was pretty awesome. It, it was almost a throwback to the Bret Hart diesel table bump from Survivor Series 95. And, you know, Breaker fought off the two guys at ringside. And there was just a lot of... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give it up to Gacy here. He, he kind of he, he kind of did an Eddie Guerrero type of thing where it's trying to get Braun disqualified by, you know, faking the chair bump. And, you know, Braun's just really selling the frustration and almost tempted to just clock Joe Gacy with the chair. But ultimately, uh, he gets helped out by an alternate ref who doesn't call for this disqualification. And, uh, you know, there was, there was one really good near fall here where Gacy actually... Uh, schoolboy him and you thought that was the finish there but uh but yeah i mean i I, I'm, I just wasn't crazy about the match as a whole i i, th I thought i thought the ending with 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 breaker um you know getting his comeback and showing the frustration i mean i thought it was good but the match as a whole it, it just took forever to get going I, I can't say i'm overly blown away by joe gacy but hey you know i i probably made a mistake by reviewing the show i should have went with my instinct and skip the show because I just I'm having a tough time even uh you know going into depth with what happened here so yeah I would definitely say if you want to check out one thing on the show check out the opening the opening match with the family and Legato del Fantasma I thought was excellent and um but you know every, every, everything else I think is pretty much skippable but uh but yeah that's NXT um in your house 2022 and I'm out